Oh Lord, you are the bread of life. May we feed on you today and always. In your name we pray, amen. Jesus was no ordinary man. As he stood before a hungry crowd with just a few barley loaves of bread and two fish, he fed everyone. And those in that large crowd that were listening to him, they were, they were just so impressed with his words from God, his power from on high. They decided among themselves that they were going to make Jesus their king. And they would do so by force if he objected. Jesus could read the crowd, of course. He knows our hearts and our minds, our thoughts. And so he quietly slipped out of their grasp. He sent his disciples on ahead of him across the Sea of Galilee, while he himself hid out among the foothills around the sea. And there, after a few hours, it became dark. And in, in the middle of the night, he walked down to the shore, and then he walked out onto the water, and then he came to the boat where his disciples were. He got in the boat, and it immediately landed on the other side of the shore. Now, the huge crowd of fans, which was more accurately described as fanatics, they hunted Jesus down. Their king got away from them now, but he can't keep running. They finally catch him in Capernaum, a city that's along the Sea of Galilee. He's in the synagogue, and there, uh, they're still ready to make him their king. Now, Jesus doesn't need anyone to make him king. He's already the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He is reigning right now over the entire universe at the right hand of his father. But Jesus is on a mission to seek and to save every last lost soul. And here in front of him are thousands and thousands of people who are seeking him out, who want to be the subjects in his kingdom. Isn't this the very uh, mission completed, uh, the, the goal achieved? Well... Speaking as a professional church worker who's charged with the evangelistic outreach of this congregation, I can tell you what I'd be doing at this point. I'd be high-fiving the vicar. I'd be high-fiving Pastor Mike, you know. If, if five, six, seven thousand people showed up to our church one Sunday, uh-huh, imagine the buzz it would create here in town. We'd get our picture in the Lutheran Witness, Right? Maybe even in the Wichita Eagle, religious section. You know, you just never know. It'd be a big deal, right? But, but Jesus wasn't high-fiving Peter and the disciples. He was not flattered by his overnight preaching success. He wasn't impressed by their religious fervor or zeal. Well, why not? We would be. See, it actually matters to Jesus why we come to him, why we would follow him, why we would be his. The goal isn't simply to fill up a few extra seats over here and here. The goal is what fills every heart, mind, and soul of every person on the earth, yours and mine. So Jesus didn't join in that excitement as the, the crowds found him, and, and they're, they're just beside themselves, giddy, and they said, how'd you get here so fast? You know, if Jesus wanted to, he could have really whipped them up into a frenzy of excitement by telling them how he got there. Remember, I, you know, I walked on the water. Uh-huh. I got into the boat, and boom, it was there on the other side. You know, he could have really uh, in, inspired them with great faith miracle stories like that, and, and more people could have been uh, added to their number. But instead of excitement, Jesus scolded them. You know, you're, you're here not because you saw this great miracle and you're convinced, you know, that I'm the one. You had a good meal, and you've come for more bread, and you want to make me your bread king. Don't work for bread that spoils. Work for bread that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. 
Well, the crowd is very agreeable at this point, and they'll do whatever Jesus says. Well, okay, if we're supposed to do the works for food that doesn't spoil, well, what's the work? Now, for every person that's ever wondered what I should be doing for God, listen up, because Jesus actually gives the answer. He says, here is the work God requires. Are you ready? To believe in the one he has sent. Well, the crowd is okay with that. Yeah, sure. What should we believe about you? And Jesus almost starts all over from the beginning. You know, you're working for food that spoils. But I am the true bread that has come down from heaven, and I give life to the world. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever comes to me will never be thirsty as they believe in me. Because, here's the deal, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Well, this completely grossed them out. And they said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That is so weird. And Jesus, he didn't stop to explain it. He just pressed even harder into that image. And he said, well, very truly I tell you, unless you eat of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Upon hearing these words, even those who had been following Jesus, calling themselves his disciples in this greater circle, not to mention all the great crowd that had just showed up, they began to disperse as they kind of looked at each other going, whoa, this is weird. How this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Now, Jesus didn't lose his confidence. He didn't go, whoa, the crowd's leaving. Oh, wait, wait, I'm, I'm just, you're not really going to eat me, okay? I'm just, it's just an, uh, an image, you know? It's a hard to explain kind of a concept that I'm trying to teach you. No, he let them go because he was so convinced that what he had taught them about himself, how he had taught them, and those who could have learned, well, everything was there for them to have the faith in him that he so desired, to be filled with him. So that if those words had not convinced them to follow, then there wouldn't be any other words that would create faith in them. And then Jesus would say some very odd words that even make us kind of pause. He said, for no one can come to me unless the Father enables them. So are, are we supposed to eat Jesus? Well, maybe that's why he gave us this meal, right? You know, his, his supper. We, we use that kind of language with it. You know, take and eat the true body of Christ. Take and drink his true blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This meal in and with and under the bread and wine, it's his true body. It's his true blood. Now we get that. We, we got this, Jesus. Okay. Just come and eat communion, and, and you got life in you. Got it. Well, while it's very easy for us to make this connection between communion and, and this bread of life that Jesus talks about, he wasn't talking about communion. He hadn't even given communion to any of his disciples at this point. But Jesus stood before the crowds and even this very day and says to you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood unless you really consume me you have no life in you and this isn't as strange or as odd as it first sounds for it is as common and as familiar as you and I consuming a good book as you and I take within ourselves the images, the music and storyline of a play or a movie or a program on television, it becomes part of us. Its story fills us and we begin to become part of its story and it remains in us and we in it. And I guess the best example of this would be my own house. You know, it, not very many days go by where uh, the boys and I, we're not quoting some kind of funny movie to each other. 
you know, with that voice and that character, and we, we're becoming that, you know, and maybe something from Napoleon Dynamite, you know, just something funny, but it, it's become part of us. We part of it as we have consumed these images and storylines. And, and we seldom stop to consider the great impact of, of all the web pages, Facebook posts, YouTube videos, programs on television and movies, all that great impact of consuming these images storylines where actually what, what they value, what they call good and right becomes our good and right. Their story becomes our story, and we're full of that. If that were not true, and if it were not that powerful, why would marketing campaigns spend millions and millions of dollars on a Super Bowl Sunday so that we can see a baby buying stock at eTrade.com? If you're laughing, you know the power then of the image, that you, you know what I'm talking about. So yes, Jesus would have us consume his body, his blood, all and everything about him so that he is in us and we are in him. His story becomes our story, his words, our words. So that when he would look at his 12 disciples and ask them, well, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Peter would answer for the rest. He would say, well, Lord, whom shall we go? Who else are we going to consume? Who else is going to fill us with eternal life? You have those words. We've become convinced and we know and we believe that you are the Holy One of God and you have come from God. Later, Jesus would say that these words from Peter were not of his own, but they were revealed to him from the Father. You see, that's what the Father is doing right now. He's enabling our hearts to hear these words, to consume them, to eat them, becoming part of us and we part of Jesus, to know and to trust that he is the true bread that has come from heaven, that in him we do have life, that in him even though we die, we will be raised to eternal life to live with Him forever. So that there really shouldn't be too many days go by where His words are not being acted out in your family, being spoken. So that there are just hours and hours and hours a week we, where we are consuming His images, His music, His words, His presence and conversation with Him. For He is true bread, true food, for the life of the world and your life. Amen.